Governor Jufa remains unwavered despite moves to oust him. Funds allocated for marking exam papers exhausted. And PNG's founding father pays tribute to the man who gave us independence. This is National MTV News with Tokana Hasavi. Good evening and welcome. Thanks for joining me for Tuesday's News. Frustrated local level government presidents and one open member in the northern province have moved to overthrow Gary Jufa as governor. The group is led by Ijivitari MP David Arore. They're fed up with the way the governor is running the province, describing him as a dictator. However, Governor Jufa responded today, saying the province is in good hands. Mr. Press, who is the next province? Who is after us? The last, Albert. the last, he fought against all the public servants, put pistol on public servants. It was visible that these council presidents were frustrated at the leadership of Governor Jufa. Back in the group is the sitting MP for Ijivitari, David Arore, who's pushing the vote of no confidence. But we believe that there are provisions in the organic law on the provincial and local level government, on the dismissal and the appointment of governors to the provincial government. And that is the reason why for us here now, you can see there are seven of us here, myself including eight, included as eight of us. Um, in the provincial government out of uh, 13. Together with Mr. Arore, the seven council presidents said they are tired of Governor Jufa's conduct. They say funding for projects have always been a problem and they want to change the governor. Our show here is just expressing that yes, there is going to be a government that's going to be simple, humble, responsive government. I have been given some projects from the PSIP, a total of 500,000. I never received any of those projects, and it's end of the year. However, in a news conference this morning, Northern Province Governor Gary Jufa said he was aware of the planned vote of no confidence in him, but says their concerns are not legitimate. I feel that they are not, you know, they are valid concerns, but they are not legitimate enough for a vote of no confidence. He said under his leadership, the province has imposed tougher measures to monitor the use of public monies. It has also banned all sale of land and pushed to stop illegal logging in the area. All these efforts, he says, are part of improving good governance. We've partnered with various NGOs, churches, to improve our health services. We've created the health authority and we've put in place an education board, that none of which existed before we turned up. At the same time, we are improving good governance measures and mechanisms to improve procurement of government services. The Provincial Supplies and Tenders Board has only been put in place last month. We are now tendering all our projects through that process. That is the legitimate process through which you procure government services. Now, I'd like to ask the open members to focus on doing that rather than using their JDP BPCs as procurement authorities, which is illegal and it is outside and in contravention of the Finance Management Act and the financial instructions. He called on the member for Ijivitari to stop pointing fingers at him because he says Mr. Aurore also has questions to answer. Outstanding project law, member of law, Aurore, I'm, I'm, I'm like running province. How am I running province? I'm not running district law. Bridget Komatep, National MTV News. More funding support is needed in the marking of examination papers for grade 10 students in the Morabe province. The funding of 20,000 kina to pay for expenses during the examination and the marking period has been exhausted. Marking was suspended last Friday and resumed this morning at the Bugandi Secondary School in Lay City. The marking of examination papers for grade 10 students in Morabe province resumed this morning. This came after teachers involved in the marking were not paid their allowances, which forced the suspension of marking last week. The funding of 20,000 kina from the Morobe Division of Education was insufficient and could not cater for the meals, accommodations and security throughout the marking period. Much of these funds were used up last week. We, we had already made a decision that funding was, uh, marking was going to be suspended. So we stopped on Friday, and we also uh, uh, did not mark yesterday, but today they just are back in the marking uh, venue. Up to 40 teachers have been engaged in the marking of the examination papers. 16 of them are from rural schools. The numbers of markers have also increased over the years 
due to the outcome-based education policy where new subjects were also tested in the examination. The Morobe Education Division, however, has not come out clear on how much additional funds they will give. Teachers say they would need almost 30,000 kina. If we had had that amount right from the beginning, the teachers would have gone right ahead. And the, the Morobe Division of Education has also asked schools in Lay to provide money to facilitate for the remaining one week. However, school principals expressed disappointments over the budget preparations by the Provincial Education Division. The pressure has to draw those limited funds to fund the marking is a bit unfair. So it's out of our budget. So we are appealing to the provincial government, if you are to be good in education, uh, put money where your, uh, your mouth is. The problem has been ongoing for almost a decade. The funding should be increased to 50,000 kina to cater for the additional subjects that are included in the examination. For many schools, especially in rural outlying districts, the funding is insufficient to bring the teachers in for marking. We, we are looking at a funding vicinity of about 60 to 70,000 in order to fund the whole process of... Sylvester Gawi, National MTV News, Lay. A draft contingency plan for PNG to pursue in the event that the deadly Ebola virus enters the country has been put together by officers from the National Health Department and the World Health Organization. Under the health guidelines, it is compulsory for a member country like PNG to have quarantine and monitoring facilities with trained staff at its entry points. This comes to light after concerns were raised about PNG's lack of capacity to deal with Ebola. So far, the country still remains vulnerable to Ebola, despite authorities saying PNG's chances are low. The health department has issued traveler awareness documents as part of its awareness campaign, including a national contingency plan. But mandatory developments, as per WHO guidelines at PNG's entry points, are yet to be seen. The action that has been taken cannot be done just by one country. It needs to be as we have seen now in the uh, outbreak in West Africa, it needs to be a global um, uh, solidarity movement that helps countries dealing with this epidemic. Within the draft contingency plan, the Prime Minister and NEC are at the helm with the appointment of a national coordination body and task force that liaise directly with the Health Minister and Secretary. Additionally, the plan indicates that hospitals must be prepared to meet elevated needs in the event of a public health emergency and be able to hospitalize an influx of patients. But this isn't the case for the Port Moresby General Hospital and plans are underway to find a suitable location. It's probably the way that we're going to have to go is to build a completely new facility uh, funded by the government at a site that is found uh, within within National Capital District, build it using the WHO specific guidelines for an isolation facility for Ebola. Dr. Sibak today confirmed via telephone to MTV News that another stakeholders meeting will occur this Friday to establish concrete plans for surveillance and quarantine measures at the Jackson's International Airport to meet with the World Health Organization's guidelines. NCD Metropolitan Superintendent Andy Bauer has confirmed the apprehension of a second suspect in the assault of the three Kundu 2 staff last Monday. The Metsoup said police are still investigating this case and praised the Marata community for providing police with information which led to this apprehension. Bauer is encouraging the public to report any information that will be helpful to police. Meanwhile, the second suspect involved in the attack of a police officer at Nine Mile is still at large. The National Capital District's campaign on banning of bitter nuts into Port Moresby has since seen many enterprising people suffering from loss of sales. The people who live just off Karama Town in the Gulf Province claim they are the worst victims of the Buai ban. Struggling to make an income to support and sustain their families, those from Karama and Yokea Village are left with no choice but to travel to Daru Island to sell their bitter nut in bulk. It's been just over a year since Governor for NCD, Powers Pakop, announced his Buai Free City campaign in public places and the main market areas of the nation's capital. With the majority of those who support the cause and the bare minimum who despise it, 
The people of Kerma say this is unfair and an unethical practice on the villages of the Gulf province. We rely uh, on boy because uh, there is no support commodities like uh, rubber, uh, we have cocoa, we have uh, vanilla, we have coffee, but uh, there's no uh, good markets, uh, there's no good market outlet. Accepting the legal, social and health ramifications of the ban, Suve Ahova, spokesman and boy seller from Yokea village, believes it's an unfair practice for villagers to travel for two days at maximum just for the sale of bitternut to establish small income to sustain their families and to an extent their community. We have a control measures at the provincial level. Uh, there will be no boy going to city with uh, the, the with skins on. There will be you know it's uh, by uh, by a product going to uh, mostly only only the boy nuts only without any skins. So if that happens, you know we have uh, we have control measures to uh, uh, stop the boy from going uh, into the city. With improm plans to better their sales of bitternut in the future, in Daru and other outlets of the country, the people of Yorkia village are seeking better governance and support from their provincial government. Lorraine Genia, National MTV News. From infrastructural development to human capacity building, Papua New Guinea can learn a lot from India. With the, with the existing bilateral relationship between both countries, the Indian High Commissioner to PNG, Mudhava Chandra, has plans to invest in the PNG economy. Given its current status as a developing nation, India, through its leaders like Gandhi, has risen to become a powerful economy against third world nations. Since his posting to PNG in August, the Indian High Commissioner has seen a lot of avenues where PNG and India can work together to develop these sectors. In each one of these sectors, I can assure you, the government of India through long years has been steady progress and development. And the skills we have attained in each one of these sectors, we can pass on to the government of PNG. The High Commissioner said health, education and infrastructure developments are three priority areas where India can invest in. He said these investments are timely because India is at the edge of an economic transition. Besides agriculture, would be development of infrastructure in PNG. It is understood that both countries have established dialogue and positive outcomes are expected. Meanwhile, the Indian High Commission supported 12 grandmothers who graduated from the Barefoot College of India last month. And a fair number of people-to-people -people contact. Besides the government-to-government -government contact, you know, I think more important are people-to-people -people contact. These mothers have returned to PNG with basic skills in solar engineering. Tekla Gunga, National MTV News. You're with National MTV News tonight. A Lone Ranger's mission to preserve Variarata National Park. I'll bring you that story and more after these short messages. Good to have you back with the news. Managing a national park is not an easy task, but one man has done that all by himself for 25 years. Kisea Tiube is the acting ranger who has committed his life to ensuring the Variarata National Park is preserved. There have been plenty, plenty of ambitious plans to transform the park, but very little action has been taken to do that. Kisea Tiube is the lone ranger that has lived his life caring for this treasure, the Varirata National Park. It is PNG's first national park opened in 1973 by Sir Albert Murray Kiki. Kisea did not intend to be a ranger. He was initially a driver, but as park rangers declined in numbers and showing no interest, Kisea became the likely candidate for the job. The last park ranger left in 2002. Nobody was interested to come up here, so they just keep me here to look after it. 
It is a memo task given the massive land area, but he has managed to do it all by himself. Uh, sometimes I really get uh, bed watching, trekking, or looking for beds. These are some of the activities yeah, yes. here. So how often do you receive visitors? Oh, um, I, uh, two times a month, the bed watching groups, like past week to us, national uh, Pacific experts and plenty to accomplish. He has watched this national treasure deteriorate before his eyes. The house he lives in, once a ranger's training quarters, is also in a poor state. Though very little attention has been given to the park, Kisea feels he has an obligation to protect Varirata for future generations. He still believes there is a glimmer of hope to bring the park back to its former glory. While he awaits the many ambitious plans to come to fruition, Kisea will be the lone ranger committed to his cause. Miki Cavera, National MTV News. Oil Church Limited has come to the aid of Kikori flood victims in the Gulf province. The distribution of supplies was carried out from the oil search site yesterday. Approximately 4,000 homes and more than 27,000 people were affected by the floods. The donation yesterday saw more than 100,000 kina worth of relief supplies distributed to people affected by the recent flooding of the Kikori River. The donation included diesel, zoom, kerosene, water tanks and numerous food items. The items were donated following an internal assessment by the company's community affairs team on the impact of floods on the people in the area. Oil Search Field Community Affairs Manager Paul Sapake handed over the items to the government officials and representatives of the affected communities at Kopi. Mr. Sapaka said the donation from oil sheds is to complement whatever assistance that has come from the Gulf Provincial Government and the National Government. Heavy rains had started in mid-June and lasted until September this year and have since subsided, but the gardens and houses were affected by the extended bad weather. Last month, the Gulf Provincial Government had stepped in with two million kina to facilitate the relief supplies in the area as well. According to Gulf Governor Javi Lakavo, the national government had committed 3 million kina, but had only given a million kina. Benny Getang, National MTV News. An important research paper was launched today by the National Research Institute on the Sovereign Wealth Fund of Papua New Guinea. The paper is an analysis of Papua New Guinea's process towards formulating its own sovereign wealth fund to assist economic stability through the active management of the country's resources as well as sustaining its future. The Sovereign Wealth Fund or SWF can be simply described as extra funds from the national budget or major investment projects in the country that can be kept aside to accumulate, sustain its future. The research has revealed that Papua New Guinea is the 10th country in the world that is most dependent on non-renewable resources which is living behind an uncertain future. However, this research presents Papua New Guinea the opportunity to secure its future. National Research Institute Director Dr. Thomas Webster says the SWF will coordinate all economic policies in the country and reduce the country's resource dependency. And so we put in a very risky decision along with other countries who are mainly dependent on the, the mineral sector for, for its contributing uh, contribution to the GDP uh, because if we spend it now we don't know whether it will be the benefits will be uh, they will be there if we spend it if we misspend it then the future generation is also going to lose out meanwhile senior researcher dr. Osborne Sanida says revenues from past extraction of PNG's natural resources have failed to impact Papua New Guinea however the SWF will have an impact on the economic stability of the country the current status of the SWF in PNG is unclear. The National Research Institute is calling on all stakeholders and the government to contribute to the SWF discussion in a properly structured and managed manner. Stanley Ovet Jr., National MTV News. Following our report last month on Yarrawari High School's plea to be a secondary school, its wish was granted today after 60 years of operating as a high school. 
The good news was delivered to the school by Central Governor Kila Hauda. It was a proud moment for Yarrawari High School. 60 years of waiting has finally come to an end. As of next year, it will be known as Yarrawari Secondary School. Headmaster Andrew Moava was delighted that this dream has become a reality. Former student and now Central Governor Kila Hauda committed a total of 2 million kina for the school's preparedness to secondary level. The money will be equally distributed to building new classrooms and a dining hall. Mr. Moava says selections will strictly be based on merit and priority will be given to its grade and students. Students have been encouraged to seriously value their studies to compete with other schools in the country. The students have expressed their gratitude and promised to do their best academically. Mickey Cavera, National MTV News. The new Tipini Primary School in Pogera, Enga, received much-needed stationaries and furniture recently. The stationaries and furniture were presented by a local Lagai Pogera MP, Nixon Mangape, witnessed by students, teachers, parents and counsellors from Tipini and Kairik. The stationaries included students and office desks, erasers, pencils, exercise books, folders, chalk and chalk boards. Tipini Primary School Headmaster James Cuppy said the presentation of the desks and stationaries were timely as the school was new and serves a growing population. The Bulolo district is still waiting to purchase a plane that will be part of an airline fleet into remote parts of Waria and Garaina. Bulolo MP Sam Basil says the delay has been caused by the slow, slow release of Australian dollars from the central bank of PNG. Bulolo district has some of the most remote and isolated LLG stations in the Morbe province. But three weeks ago, the district made a drastic move to purchase its own plane to deal with its problems of getting to the people. No. And as, as for me, back in Bulolo, we can't lose that plane. We need that uh, transaction to take place so my people can benefit from that air. Uh, uh, purchase of the aircraft that we wanted to purchase. So this is the Bololo MP the Sam Basil explains the process taken by the bank. The district has engaged in the purchase of the plane, but there has been delays to the buy. And we are on the the deputy opposition the leader has called on Treasurer Patrick Pruich to explain why it has taken three weeks for the Bank of Papua New Guinea to approve the Australian dollars for the transaction of the plane. No. Uh, I'm calling on to the treasurer before he delivers the next budget and do a, also a mini budget, I believe, that is coming up in the next session of uh, parliament. I want to ask the treasurer to announce to the people of Papua New Guinea and business houses and the communities that how much of the reserve, foreign reserve do we have in Papua New Guinea. We believe some large transactions made by uh, the government and we believe it may have been the re repayment of the UBS loan. It's understood that Papua New Guinea's central bank is regulating the amount of money being spent overseas. Authorization is now needed to spend over 50,000 kina. Much of the Bulolo district is separated by fast flowing rivers and mountains that often make service delivery difficult. For those places that are closer to roads, infrastructure can be built and improved for the people. <laughs> Kare Wangu lives close to a road that has made it possible for the infrastructure to happen, for this footbridge to be built. Kare explains the difficulty her family had crossing the river from where she lives to the other side. But for rural parts of Bulolo district, the story is different. Places like Goraina, Tekadu and Waria are inaccessible by road. The new plane was to help with logistics where roads, footbridges and other infrastructures in health and education are difficult to build and maintain. Bethany Harriman, National MTV News, Lay. A final report on the heavy lift twin otter crash on Mount Laws may take months to conclude. The Accidents and Investigation Commission's Acting Chief Director, David Inau, says this process will continue. When releasing the preliminary crash report yesterday, Mr. Inau made it clear that all preliminary aviation occurrences are factual and do not contain analysis, conclusions or recommendations. Mr. Inau said that from the report, they had noted that in the pilot's initial communication with the tower, he had mentioned the instrument landing system, but he did not request a discontinuation of the approved visual approach to land, 
and did not request radio vectors to position the aircraft for an ILS approach and landing. The AIC has continued to be transparent in its handling of this latest aviation crash. And now we take a look at the finance news. The Kina closed unchanged at 0.397 US dollars in the interbank market. And at Bank South Pacific, the Kina was buying 0.3895 US dollars, 0.4382 Australian dollars, 0.2963 Euro, and 41.18 Japanese yen. Looking at commodity prices at New York close, gold, cocoa, and copper closed higher, coffee closed lower. Palm oil, crude oil, and copper all closed lower. And finally, on the stock market, the Dow Jones closed at 19 points lower, the ASX closed at 7 points lower, and the All Ordinaries closed at 18 points higher. You're with National MTV News. When we come back, tributes to former Australian Prime Minister Gough Whitlam, who passed away aged 98. Stay tuned. Welcome back to the news. The parliaments of PNG and Queensland in Australia continues to carry out twinning arrangements. Through an MOU, both parliaments exchanged information of common interest and provide much needed training to enhance the work of the Speaker's office. Queensland Parliament Speaker Fiona Simpson and her parliamentarians met with PNG Parliament Speaker Theo Zurino yesterday. They discussed general issues, work and politics among others. During their stay in the country, the delegation will observe the Parliament session this week. Turning overseas now, former Australian Prime Minister Gough Whitlam, the towering giant who led Australia's Labour Party out of the political wilderness in 1972 and was sensationally sacked less than three years, later has died at the age of 98. Channel 9's political editor, Laurie Oakes, looks back on an amazing career of a razor-sharp politician who changed so many lives. It was one of the most dramatic moments in Australian political history. Well, may we say, God save the Queen. Because nothing will save the Governor-General. Gough Whitlam inspiring Labor supporters to maintain the rage after the dismissal of his government on November 11, 1975 by Governor-General Sir John Kerr. The mood of anger and bitterness was in stark contrast to the hope and optimism just three years earlier when Labor won office after 23 years in the wilderness of opposition. How does it feel to be Prime Minister-elect? I'm not used to it yet, I suppose. Does the job frighten you at all, sir? Not in the least. Edward Gough Whitlam, whose father Fred became Commonwealth Crown Solicitor, was born in Melbourne, spent his school days in Sydney and Canberra, then went on to Sydney University where he met and married Margaret Dovey. When the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbour in 1941, he enlisted in the RAAF as a navigator in a bomber squadron, an attempt by wartime Labor Prime Minister John Curtin to reform the Constitution aroused his interest in politics. After a period practising law and with a young family, Mr Whitlam entered Federal Parliament at a by-election for the outer Sydney seat of Werriwa in 1952, became Deputy Labor leader to Arthur Corwell in 1960 and then leader after the ALP's devastating defeat in the 1966 election fought on the issue of the Vietnam War. As deputy, then as leader, Gough Whitlam reformed the ALP, broadening its appeal to attract white-collar as well as blue-collar workers, risking expulsion in battles with hardliners who controlled the party machine. His motto was, crash through or crash. In the 1969 election, he achieved a massive swing against Prime Minister John Gorton. I don't think there's ever been so large a swing. Three years later, government at last, when he defeated another Liberal opponent, William McMahon. The impatient new Prime Minister formed an interim two-man administration with his deputy Lance Barnard and in a whirlwind fortnight they abolished national service, withdrew Australian troops from Vietnam, banned racially selected sporting teams from visiting Australia, established diplomatic relations with communist China, took the first moves towards Aboriginal land rights and set up inquiries into the financial needs of state and church schools. When a full ministry was sworn in, the reformist pace hardly slackened. Measures ranging from free universities to equal pay for women 
from welfare payments for single parent families to establishment of the family court. But after barely 18 months, the coalition used its Senate numbers to force a double dissolution election by threatening to cut off the government's money supply. A narrow Whitlam victory enabled him to pass controversial legislation, including a bill to establish a universal health insurance scheme, through a historic joint sitting of the House of Representatives and the Senate. Things no quickly comment. started to go wrong though, and several scandals and ministerial sackings on top of economic problems gave the coalition an excuse in late 1975 for another decision to block supply bills in the Senate. The opposition now has no choice. We will use the power vested in us by the Constitution and delay the passage of the government's money bills through the Senate until the Parliament goes to the people. This time, Mr Whitlam tried to hang on to office rather than go to the polls. And after weeks of deadlock, the Governor-General, Sir John Kerr, sacked him, appointing Liberal leader Malcolm Fraser as caretaker Prime Minister. Labor was resoundingly defeated in the ensuing election. And two years later, after another big defeat, Mr Whitlam bowed out of politics to become the Labor Party's greatest folk hero. When Margaret Whitlam died, aged 92, he declared simply, she was the love of my life. What drove his political career? In one of his last public statements, Gough Whitlam himself put it best. A more equal, open, tolerant and independent Australia. These values are at the heart of the Whitlam legacy. On the same note, founding Prime Minister of Papua New Guinea, Sir Michael Somare, today expressed his sadness of the passing of former Australian Prime Minister Gough Whitlam. Sir Michael said the late Whitlam was a dynamic leader who felt that PNG was emerging as a leader in the Pacific. The two leaders witnessed the lowering of the Australian flag and raising of PNG's red, black and gold colours in 1975. Many may not know him, but he is an Australian PNG historians would hardly forget because of his leadership and contribution for PNG to gain independence. Edward Gough Whitlam was Australia's 21st Prime Minister from 1972 to 1975. His sudden passing away shocked PNG's founding father, Grand Chief Sir Michael Somare, who says the late Whitlam was a great Australian who had the heart of our small nation. Sir Michael attempted to do a special suspension for standing order in today's parliament session to express his grief, but was denied. When the world was saying, we are not ready, when the rest of Papua New Guineans were saying, they are not prepared, they are not ready, he came out and supported my idea of in the early independence for Papua New Guinea. That's the reason why I felt I should say something to parliament, so people of Papua New Guinea would know. Sam Michael said Whitlam's political engagements and oversight of PNG has enriched greatly towards and after PNG gaining independence. He described his special attachment with Whitlam not only in politics but family. But as a founding Prime Minister of Papua New Guinea, as I said on behalf of my wife, Veronica, and our family, our sadness, we heard of our sadness of passing away of great Australian, greatest Australian, the late Gough Woodlam today, uh, Tuesday 21st October, passed away 2014. Having assisted our course in leading Papua New Guinea uh, to nationhood in 1975, I've always felt a debt of gratitude to late Gough Woodlam. Prime Minister Peter O'Neill extended his condolences to the family of the late Edward Gough Woodlam stating late Whitlam will always hold a special place in the history of Papua New Guinea as the Australian Prime Minister who worked with our founding fathers to achieve independence. Meanwhile, leader of government business and finance minister James Marape will say government's condolences tomorrow when parliament resumes. Jack LaPave Jr. National MTV News. Well, that's a take on our news segment tonight. We have a big lineup in sports that's coming up next, including updates on the sixth BSP PNG Games. Stay tuned. Two Kai Sports.
BSP PNG Games 2014. 25 days to go. Support your province. 25 days out of the opening of the 6th BSP PNG Games, the PNG Games Host Organising Committee has broken the news that Jessica Marboy will not be a part of this year's grand opening. Although the reason behind it is not entirely clear, the HLC is pleased to announce that five-time ARIA award winner and Australian pop singer Christine Anu will be the international superstar leading a number of local opening acts. Known for her biggest hit released in 1995, My Island Home, her music is parallel to one of the main objectives of the PNG Games to promote national unity and provincial pride. She's 17 with, a promising sign, with promising signs of maturity. Jenny Albert was identified from the 2012 PNG Games when representing her birth province in athletics. The young Simbulas has a long way to go under the thorough guidance of the PNG Athletics Union. She was part of the team that competed in the Oceania Cross Country Championships in Guam. A double celebration for young 17-year-old Jenny Albert who has come a long way to set records in her athletic career. She is part of a selected group of athletes by the PNG Athletics Union for the 2015 Pacific Games in specialty, middle and long distance. And she just proved their worth at Guam coming home with gold. She won the women's 800 meter over in 2 minutes 19 seconds ahead of Tunatine and US-based Poro Gahe Kave in 2013 Mini Pacific Games in Wallis and Futuna. I'm proud that uh, we, we lost our uh, Pacific Games here yeah? and I'm looking forward to take part. In she was identified from the 2012 PNG Games in Kokopo and from there on she didn't look back as she centered her spot in Korea and school. I used to run 800 and 1500 but I don't know I went to marathon, so I, I think I'll take part in 800 and 1500. She's no exception for PNG Games as she will join forces with Team Simbu. 2015 Pacific Games is on the brim and this young star will surely shine on home soil and that is why she's working towards it. Terre Alex, National MTV Sports. To athletics. PNG and Indonesia will take part in a long-distance race in Wutong, Sandan province to Skull in the Papua province of Indonesia. More than 500 runners from the two provinces will take on the challenge. One of PNG's elite runners, Simbai Kaspar, will be a special guest at the event following his recent success at the cross-country championships in Guam. These are pictures from last year's race which started on the Indonesian side and ended at the border. Papua province won the race. Grand Chief Sir Michael Somara was also among guests who attended the presentation of prize winners. This year's race will start at Wafa in Wutong, 8 kilometers from No Man's Island and finish on the Indonesian side next to the border market. And True Guys Sports continues after the break. Stay with us. True Kai Sports. Welcome back to True Kai Sports. Since the recent inception of the Pacific Union Rugby Program in Daru, the island has seen many children adhere to the rollout of the program with an influx of girls showing interest in the male-dominated sport. The curriculum-based program has created a perfect avenue for many children to excel in both fields of academy and co-curriculum. Although rugby union has been the dominant sporting code in the western province and most significantly on Daru Island, the code had been lacking junior development in previous years. With the Pacific and Union program on board since March this year, schools, children and the community have embraced it to the fullest. Schools coordinator Robin Chowka said the PIU program worked in many favours to the school. With the program, they have seen an influx of children now wanting to attend school and be more involved within the community. And because of their commitment, because they have, they have this interest to rugby union, because they have been disinterested to this program, they have actually made every effort to go to school every day so that they can at least learn at the end of the day, uh, at the end of every, I mean, every day with um, the, the games, by uh, training on uh, this rugby union. 
The most significant part of rugby union in Daru is changing the mentality of rugby being a male-dominated sport. <laughs> While many have shown interest in establishing women's rugby on the small island, the school children are enthusiasts of rugby and junior ambassadors for change. The Pacific Union program is played consecutively throughout the year, with over five schools from Daru participating in weekly festivals. So currently we have uh, played, the schools have played uh, several games uh, during the weekends, especially on Saturdays prior to our Daru competition uh, games. <laughs> Lorraine Genia, National MTV Sports. Since the inception of handball in PNG late last year, young men from the National Capital District have taken the sport to another level. Training hard at the High Performance Training Center in Port Moresby, the boys are preparing for their first ever handball championships in New Zealand and are already looking strong and fit for the challenge in international competition. With the introduction of handball in PNG, a squad of 24 boys were selected and we caught up with them training at the High Performance Training Centre. From the 24 boys squad, only 19 boys will be selected to travel to New Zealand for their Oceania Championships. This will be their first time to travel for their international inaugural competition for International Handball Trophy Tournament in New Zealand. President Robert Doko said in order to select the 19 boys, they must qualify with the criteria, one of which is their training attendance. Uh, the team's travel is fun, fully funded by the International Handball Federation, but obviously the little things like your visas, passports. The competition will be played indoors with seven aside and the boys will play against the top experienced countries. Doko also said they have come up with different programs. We're going forward and they've got a very strong emphasis on schools program and they have a strong handball in schools program that they do um, throughout the, all its affiliated members. Um. The aim is to get the sports involved in the next PNG games and to conduct clinics within the country to make the sport popular. Godwin Eki, National MTV Sports. The Killa Killa Darts Association put to test the two sides that set the pace right from the beginning of the season. Spartans and Whitecliffe went neck to neck over the weekend in the semi playoff. Spartans made a clean sweep with five stars to nil to face off with Cora Saints in the grand final playoff this weekend. The Killa Killa community in Mosby South Electorate knows a better way to spend a weekend. You wouldn't go past this bunch who front up every weekend in a game of darts. Traditionally, darts is regarded a pub game, but on a professional note, it is more competitive and involves athletes of all ages, as long as they meet the set criteria. All smiles as the PNG power-powered Spartans took to the board, with diligent stamina, concentration and good coordination from singles, doubles, troubles and the team walkout winners. The neatly knitted white cliff outfit was not able to put us down the board as they narrowly trounced five stars to kneel over the spirited Spartans. Spartans advanced to the final to meet the Kauri Saints this weekend. Meanwhile, that is included in the PNG games and will be played at the Egan Barracks. Tere Alex, National MTV Sports. And that's a take on True Guy Sports tonight. Coming up next, the weather details. Stay with us. True Guy Sports. True Kai Sports. This weather information is proudly brought to you by Tablebirds. A quick look at the weather forecast for tonight and tomorrow in southern region, Port Moresby, Karama and Popondetta to expect evening showers. In Momase, showers and thunderstorms in Lay City. In the New Guinea Islands, few showers expected in Loringa, Kimbe and Kaviang. And lastly, in the Highlands region, all centres, evening showers, then morning fog. 
Well, that's been National MTV News this Tuesday. From all of us here at MTV News, I'm Tokana Hasavi. Thanks for your company. Take care and stay safe.